China unveils a Starship clone, Hakuto R litho breaks on the moon, and SpaceX leases a historic launch pad. It's Friday the 28th of April 2023, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and welcome to This Week in Spaceflight, where we'll review the latest news and launches that have happened during the week. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a PSLV rocket with the Talios 2 spacecraft. Liftoff occurred on April 22nd at 8.49 UTC from the first launch pad at the Satish Dhawan Space Center. The Talios 2 spacecraft is an imaging satellite that uses a synthetic aperture radar. This technology allows it to peer through thick clouds or capture images during the night without worrying about the sunlight. Along for the ride was the Lumalite 4 12-unit CubeSat, which will be carrying out an on-orbit demonstration of a space-based VHF data exchange system for maritime users. The fourth stage of the PSLV also acted as host to several payloads, acting as what is called the PSLV Orbital Experimental Module 2. Now, if you really want an in-depth overview of the launch and all of its payloads, you can find it on our news website, we still have it, in an article written by William Graham. Despite the fog and an abort the day before, SpaceX launched another batch of Starlink satellites on April 27th at 1340 UTC from Vandenberg Space Force Base. The mission, called Starlink Group 3-5, marked the resumption of flights of Starlink Group 3 missions after an almost year-long pause. These Starlink satellites operate in polar orbits instead of operating at mid- and high-inclination orbits, offering Starlink coverage over polar regions of the Earth. The booster, B-1061, was launching for the 13th time and successfully landed on Of Course I Still Love You, although it had a bit of a fiery burp after touchdown. For a full in-depth overview of the launch, you can read the splendid article about it written by our magnificent and absolutely brilliant writer Alejandro and, oh, of course he also wrote this script, so well played Alex. I'm sure people will now check out your article after this. Hakuto R finally reached the surface of the moon, but it may not have been in one piece. The Hakuto R lunar lander was built by Japanese aerospace company iSpace. It was launched in December of last year on board a Falcon 9 rocket from Florida and was then put into a low energy transfer orbit towards the moon. The spacecraft then performed several correction maneuvers and finally entered lunar orbit just five weeks ago on March 21st. After several further checkouts and maneuvers around the moon, Hakuto R lowered itself to a 100 km circular orbit from where it would initiate its descent. This descent started about an hour before the landing on April 25th at around 1540 UTC. At that moment, Hakuto ignited its engines to reduce the periapsis, or the lowest point of its orbit, to just 25 km above the surface. Once it arrived at that periapsis, it started the powered descent to the surface of the moon. This powered descent proceeded well through the final vertical landing phase. However, a few seconds before the landing, the company lost communications with the lander and were never able to regain them. A few hours after the landing attempt, iSpace confirmed through a press release that initial data review indicated the lander ran out of propellant when it was close to finishing its landing and that it was very likely it made a hard landing on the lunar surface. That's what we tend to call litho breaking iSpace says a more comprehensive result of the analysis will be shared when they complete the investigation. So while not achieving the landing, Hakuto R reached the moon, and the data gathered on this mission will be used for iSpace's next two lunar landing missions. So here's hoping that next time around, the only lunar dust it kicks up is from the engines as it touches down gently onto the surface of the moon. China has unveiled yet another design change for their Changzheng 9 rocket, but this one has a very familiar face. You've probably seen the headline everywhere. China wants to land an astronaut on the moon before 2030. The country has set out its plans for the near and long-term future to be about landing on the moon, as well as setting up a research station on its south pole in collaboration with Russia. However, to do this, they need a heavy rocket, a spacecraft, and of course, a lander. They're developing all of them at once right now, but the current plans feature not just one rocket, but two heavy rockets. These are the Changzheng 9 and the Changzheng 10 rockets. 
Don't let the numbers fool you. The Changzheng 10 is actually smaller and less capable than the Changzheng 9, although still a large rocket. This rocket is said to be of modular design with variants in single core or triple core configurations, similar to Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. In fact, its capability to low Earth orbit and the moon is very similar, uses kerosene, and even uses clusters of engines on each booster. On top of that, China may be looking into reusing these boosters later down the line using propulsive landing. So of course, if the Changzheng 10 looks like a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, it's no surprise that the Changzheng 9, much larger and capable, looks like a starship. Except. That's not always been the case. In fact, the news this week is that now it actually looks like Starship after years and years of design changes. The Changzheng 9 was initially presented in 2009, and back then its design looked more like SLS. The rocket would feature a big central core with solid rocket boosters to its sides, and back then they were still undecided on the fuel for the rocket, with versions presented for either kerosene or hydrogen fuel. Over the years, the design changed, dropping the solid propellant boosters and using liquid-fueled boosters. The central core would be Carolox with Hydrolox upper stages for higher efficiency. But of course, reusability was all the rage, so the design changed yet again to be reusable. Another change came in 2021. The rocket would drop the boosters, and instead the first stage would feature a large cluster of engines. This evolved in 2022 with China considering methane as its fuel and booster landing and recovery for reuse. However, the upper stages were still expendable and fueled by hydrogen. The latest design change now includes upper stage reusability, with a two-stage fully reusable version of the Changzheng 9 being presented just a few days ago. This new design would feature a giant booster with 30 methane-fueled engines that would land and be caught mid-air. A reusable second stage with two of these methane-fueled engines would be on top. It would sport a heat shield for re-entry protection and flaps for aerodynamic control. Hmm, sounds familiar, right? On the same conference, Chinese officials confirmed that this variant was still very early in design process and that it would not be produced or launched until the 2040s. So in the meantime, they'll still use an earlier design version in the 2030s to support the lunar base, while the Changzheng 10 rocket, the one that looks like Falcon Heavy, would be used for early landings on the moon towards the end of this decade. Our own Adrian Bile wrote an entire article for our website talking in depth about this new design change and its implications. So check that out if you want to dive into all of that info. It's really, really great. He has also covered China's space development in other past articles. So if you want to get all the info on what's next for them, be sure to stick around because we're going to be reporting on all that we can. SpaceX gets a new launch pad for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Yes, not for Starship, but for Falcon. The launch pad in question? None other than historic Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Yes, I know a lot of launch pads out there get called historic, but really this pad has tons of history. It was first started in the 1960s by the U.S. Air Force to support launches of the Titan III rocket for the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program. However, when the program was canceled, so did the launch pad plans. Interest for it came back in the 1970s with the development of the Space Shuttle program. The U.S. Air Force was interested in using the shuttle to launch military satellites into polar orbit, and Slick 6 was the one chosen for that. It took several years of construction and lots of money to prepare the launch pad, but finally in 1984, the Space Shuttle Enterprise was transported to Vandenberg and stacked on the pad for fit checks. The pad would later be used for an actual spaceflight in late 1986, using Space Shuttle Discovery, which would become the West Coast Orbiter. The pad was in a completely different location and design than what had been used at the Kennedy Space Center already, so lots of problems popped up. Chris Bergen, NASA Spaceflight Actual, wrote about many of these differences in an article this week, including some funny stories about remedies to these issues. You probably want to check it out. Now, as you probably know, in 1986, the Challenger disaster happened, and the plans for a Vandenberg shuttle launch pad came to a halt and were eventually canceled. While the safety concerns after Challenger were part of the reason, the issues mentioned before were also amounting to lots of delays and cost overruns that didn't help either. It would take almost a decade until interest would come back. 
In the mid-1990s, Lockheed Martin invested in the launch complex to launch their Athena-1 and Athena-2 rockets. However, the U.S. Air Force would later grant the lease of the facility to Boeing for their Delta IV and Delta IV heavy rockets. These two rockets later became part of United Launch Alliance, with the last West Coast Delta IV heavy launching in September of last year. And now, it's time for SpaceX to bring Space Launch Complex 6 into the 2020s with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. It's still too early to know how the pad will look, if more landing pads and drone ships will be needed, but certainly it seems like SpaceX is not abandoning the West Coast, and it is there to stay. A fourth launch pad for the Falcon rocket family will likely bring up additional cadence, and Falcon Heavy could continue Delta IV Heavy's legacy of launching big military payloads into polar orbit. And who knows, perhaps in the future SpaceX changes its mind and starts modifying it for the big shiny rocket. NASA will be carrying out a spacewalk on the ISS on April 28th to prepare it for the addition of more ISS rollout solar arrays, or IROSA, to be launched next month on the SpaceX CRS-28 cargo mission. The spacewalk will feature United Arab Emirates astronaut Sultan Al-Niadi and will make him the first Arab person to conduct an EVA, or extravehicular activity. Weather also threatens another SpaceX launch. A Falcon 9 is set to launch a pair of O3B M-Power internet satellites for SES. The launch will be happening next door from Falcon Heavy, and despite this one being delayed, both launches are set to launch within hours of each other. This launch for SES would occur on April 28th within an 88-minute window that opens at 2112 UTC. It's certainly going to be a feat for SpaceX to pull off two launches this close to each other, both in place and time, and with only a 20% chance of favorable weather, but you can bet NSF will be there live streaming it if they go for it. Next week, Rocket Lab promises to rocket like a hurricane with the launch of NASA's third and fourth tropic satellites from New Zealand. The two-hour launch window is set to open on May 1st at 1 UTC. This will be the first of a two-launch campaign with the fifth and sixth tropic satellites set for launch two weeks after these. After a delay of about a week, Roscosmos will perform a spacewalk on the ISS to relocate a 13-year-old airlock from the Rosviet module to the Naoka module. This airlock will be used for deployment of payloads from the inside of the Russian segment of the ISS, augmenting the science capabilities of Naoka. And that's your weekly recap! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.